As construction continues on the new launch tower, SpaceX pushes ahead with the assembly of the first Block 2 Starship. Crews continue their preparations for a possible booster catch with the first launch tower, and testing also gets underway at the Massey Outpost. Now let's dig into this week's update. Picking up from where we left off last week, the second launch tower's chopstick carriage completed its journey from the port of Brownsville to the tower module storage yard at Sanchez. A short time later, Test Tank 16 began rolling out of Mega Bay 2, navigating the busy ring yard area before beginning its journey from the build site to the Massey Outpost for testing. This test tank features a Block 2 ship skirt and will be tested under flight loads to verify the design. A construction elevator rail was lifted into Module 3 of the new launch tower as construction advanced towards installing the fourth tower module. Inside the high bay, workers began dismantling the scaffolding around Starship 30 as it moves through processing for Flight 5. Meanwhile, a concrete pump truck began setting up to resume placing concrete on the new office building's roof. Across the road from the build site, where the Texas Department of Transportation has blocked off parking ahead of scheduled work, excavators began digging up the ground. As Starship Block 2 moves towards production, a new version of the Starlink dispenser, along with an integrated work stand, were spotted moving from Star Factory to Mega Bay 2. Components for a new Block 2 ship lifter were also seen being brought in from Sanchez before stopping in the ring yard in front of the bays. And just a few minutes later, the new payload dispenser was brought into the right corner of Mega Bay 2. Once the dispenser parts were out of the way, the Block 2 ship lifter components were offloaded into the ring yard. After a few hours of preparation, Test Tank 16 was lifted into the flight load test stand at Massey's outpost. Continuing the work started earlier, an excavator began loading earth into a truck in front of the build site. Several hours after beginning concrete placement, crews finished the job on the office building roof before packing up and heading home. Over at the launch complex, safety netting was being installed on the second module of the new tower. The netting is meant to catch drop tools and other small items that are dangerous to workers on the ground. A two-point ship lifter was rolled into the build site from the highway, stopping next to the Star Factory before being moved behind the building. And early on Saturday morning, workers began inspecting the new Block 2 ship lifter, raising it vertical and examining the four connection points on the arms. After inspecting the hard points, the lifting arms were set back down. The Starship static fire test stand was relocated from the Massey outpost to the build site and was set down in the ring yard. The two-point ship lifter, which was staged around the corner on Star Factory, was brought into Mega Bay 2 and connected to the main crane. The lifter was then raised above the center work stand. After sunrise, another section of safety netting was raised and installed on the side of the under construction launch tower. With heat shield work largely complete on Starship 30 now, the Flight 5 ship was rolled out of the high bay and relocated to Mega Bay 2. As the sun began to set at Starbase, Ship 30 was lifted up, hanging suspended in the air as the static fire stand was rolled into the bay. Once the ship and stand were lined up, the ship was then set down and prepared for departure to the Massey Outpost. Ship 30 rolled out of Mega Bay 2 on Sunday morning, making its way to the main entrance to Highway 4 before setting off down the road. Small segments of the ship have been left untiled, likely giving engineers non-vital instrumentation points to study how the ship's structure will perform during re-entry. The ship began its journey around 3 a.m., rolling up the highway towards Brownsville over the next two hours. Once at the site, the ship was set down over the flame trench. With the sun up at the launch site now, another length of safety netting was installed on the new launch tower. Once in position, the netting support structures were bolted to the launch tower. Back at the build site, a ship transport stand was taken off site and relocated to the rocket garden, making more room for ship and booster assembly. A three-ring barrel section was brought into Mega Bay 2 a few minutes later. A sudden, intense storm began to roll in from the Gulf shortly before noon, bringing activity to a halt amidst the driving wind and billowing dust. 
As the storm arrived at the launch complex, workers were attempting to attach the barrel segment to the load spreader in Mega Bay 2. Eventually, the strong winds forced workers to stop their efforts. The doors to the bay were closed a few minutes later, both to protect the hardware inside and let crews get back to work. The fourth segment of the new launch tower began rolling out to the launch complex shortly after midnight on Monday. It headed out of the Sanchez storage yard and pulled onto Highway 4 for a quick 40-minute trip to the launch site entrance. Gingerly making the sharp turn to the construction site, the tower segment was rolled in and staged just inside the gate. A liquid methane pump was removed from the orbital tank farm, with its replacement arriving for installation a few hours later. The tank farm propellant pumps have been subject to frequent replacement over the years as operations continue to dial in the specifications of the launch pad systems. Outside the build site, Sea Level Raptor engines 375, 391, and Vacuum Raptor 320 were relocated to Mega Bay 2, making use of custom remote control carts with omnidirectional wheels. For a bit of fun, each of the engine carts are named after characters in the Mario Kart games. A ship payload bay door was spotted as it was being rolled into the high bay for installation in Ship 33's nose cone. Tuesday morning at the launch complex saw the fourth and final section of safety netting lifted for installation on the new launch tower. However, a few minutes later, after the netting was maneuvered into place, the installation was aborted and the netting was lowered back to the ground. At the same time, Vacuum Raptor number 376 was rolled through the ring yard into Mega Bay 2. Back at the launch complex, a concrete pump truck began to place concrete near the base of the second tower. A second pump truck joined in a few minutes later as construction crews began filling the foundations for a new launch site structure with concrete. Inside SpaceX's new office building, workers have been installing flights of prefabricated stairways. The flight of stairs to the fourth floor proved to be a tricky one, with workers needing five hours to get it in place. With a bit of help from a forklift, Sea Level Raptor 386 was relocated to Mega Bay 2, joining the other four engines in the left side of the bay. Sheet piles were being hammered into place near the new launch tower. These sheet pile walls will support the ground when workers begin to excavate the launch pad's expected flame trench. The Sarens crane picked up the load spreader as workers prepared to install the next module onto the tower. The fourth module was brought over towards the tower and workers began to attach the load spreader's pre-installed lifting eyes to the anchoring points at the top of the columns. A sea level Raptor, the sixth and final engine for Ship 31, was relocated to Mega Bay 2, joining the other five brought in earlier on the left side of the bay. A booster grid fin was spotted while it was being relocated to Star Factory, maneuvering through the ring yard before driving into the Star Factory building. A second grid fin was spotted an hour later. Ship 33's forward section, the first of the Block 2 ships, was relocated to Mega Bay 2 on Wednesday evening. The ship features a new forward flap design that has been repositioned on the ship, and the cargo bay appears to have been shortened by a couple of ring segments. This keeps the ship's overall length the same while adding larger propellant tanks to the ship. A ship transport stand was relocated from Sanchez to the build site on Thursday, rolling into the ring yard before being repositioned towards Mega Bay 2. The stand was ultimately set down in front of the bay on the right side. Meanwhile, crews at the launch site were making modifications to the Starbird chopstick on Tower 1, improving the chopstick's bumper systems ahead of the catch attempt scheduled for Flight 5. The installation work was completed about an hour later. Over at the Massey Outpost, Test Tank 16 was put through cryogenic testing, leaving it frosty with liquid nitrogen. Test Tank 16 was detanked after about 30 minutes. Surprisingly, it was immediately refilled, either continuing tests or as a part of a separate measure. After several days of waiting on site, Module 4 of the second launch tower was lifted into the air. Over the next hour, crews carefully maneuvered the tower module into place. It was slowly lowered down to the top of Module 3 and smoothly eased into place. After several hours of additional testing at the Massey Outpost, Test Tank 16 was detanked and testing concluded. 
One of the propellant tank farm recondenser units was removed from the farm as the reconfiguration of the orbital tank farm continues. The decommissioned recondenser unit was laid horizontal onto an awaiting transport truck to be hauled out of the launch site. Peeking through the beams and columns of the office, Booster 15's liquid oxygen tank was lifted and stacked onto the lower thrust dome in Mega Bay 1. Work continued on the starboard chopstick, with additional components being added to the arms for catching boosters. This installation attempt ended up being aborted, and another attempt would not be made until Friday. After completing the installation of the fourth module, the fifth module of the new launch tower was brought to the launch site. Two of the hinge points for the ship quick disconnect arm and its hydraulic actuator are visible on the side of this reinforced module, as well as a bracing arm for one of the two hinges on the fourth module. This week at the Cape, SpaceX support ship Bob returned to port on Friday as SpaceX continued to wait for the FAA to approve their return to flight following the failure of Starlink 9-3. Signet Warhorse 1 returned to port with a short fall of Gravitas on Saturday as the holding pattern continued. On Sunday, Signet Warhorse 1 headed out to sea once more, bringing a short follow Gravitas out for the Starlink Group 10-4 mission for an expected late week launch. Bob then headed out to sea as well on Sunday, also in support of Starlink Group 10-4. The Pegasus barge, carrying the Artemis II core stage, arrived at Port Canaveral in the afternoon, where it would stay overnight. The next day, the Pegasus barge made the rest of the journey to the turn basin at Kennedy Space Center where the SLS core stage would be unloaded for transport to the vehicle assembly building. Artemis II's core stage was offloaded from Pegasus on Wednesday, orienting itself in the turning lot before being driven into the vehicle assembly building. Inside the VAB, the core stage will be integrated with its solid rocket boosters, Orion capsule, and the European service module. The mission is expected to fly no earlier than September 2025 and will be the first crewed lunar flyby since 1972. Signet Warhorse 3 towed just read the instructions out to sea for the Starlink Group 10-9 mission, which is also expected to launch this weekend. Go Cosmos joined just read the instructions at sea a few hours later, likewise in support of the Starlink Group 10-9. Pegasus then departed Port Canaveral on Thursday, beginning its journey back to the Michoud Assembly Facility in Louisiana. Also on Thursday, the FAA approved Falcon 9 to return to flight, and a Starlink payload was brought out to the Horizontal Integration Facility to be mated to the rocket. At the same time, SpaceX released an explanation of the incident with Starlink 9-3's upper stage. In their report, SpaceX said that the failure was caused by a leak in a loosely installed liquid oxygen pressure check line, which cracked during the launch from the vibrations. The line began to leak liquid oxygen underneath the engine's insulation blanket, then out into space. While this didn't stop the stage from completing its first burn, it did cause the engine to get much colder than it should have during its coast phase as the frozen liquid oxygen vented into space. Critically, this caused the engine's stores of ignition fluid to get much colder than they should have. When the engine was started at the end of the coast phase, the cold mixture inside the combustion chamber exploded, often referred to as a hard start. To fix the problem, SpaceX is simply deleting the pressure sense line from the engine. The first new Glenn Interstage was relocated to LC-36 as Blue Origin continues to move towards the first flight of its first orbital vehicle. Meanwhile, the crawler way was being reconditioned by Mobile Launch Platform 1, rolling over freshly laid rock to crush it into a consistent size for the potential return of Mobile Launcher 1. And there you have it, another SpaceX and Starbase weekly update brought to you by Lab Padre. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if you haven't already, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for watching. Lab Padre out.